A man with disabilities has been found dead from bronchopneumonia. He appears also to have been heavily beaten. Christopher was in such a physically weakened state that even his immune system was giving up. Thames Valley police discover that the man's wife has a story to tell. It was quite disturbing to watch. And then it, it, it did get... Yeah, I... I did hit him a bit harder sometimes. Could this be a murder? The evidence of Hannah Gret Donnelly suggested there were matrimonial issues. What is clear here is that the level of control and the level of abuse made this an almost everyday occurrence. I punched him on his nose severely because I was so angry with him, but he didn't have such a big cut. Experts agree that men and women kill for different reasons and in different ways. When a woman murders, it is often in rage, jealousy, passion. This is the series that looks into the hearts and minds of the lady killers. On a sunny March day, 55-year-old music teacher Christopher Donnelly is reported by his wife as dead at their home in Oxfordshire. There was a mystery here for the police to solve. This was not a natural death, although that is exactly what Hannah Gret had implied when she called the ambulance. In the first phase of the investigation, it was not clear that Christopher had been murdered. Police probed Hannah Gret Donnelly. Within your family, what would you say your role is? Um, yeah, I don't know. I like to know what's going on, so, but, yeah. Um, be informed as to what is going on. I don't like, uh, like when people talk behind my back. Over the coming weeks, evidence would emerge which suggested something very wrong had happened behind the closed doors of an ordinary home on an ordinary street in an English town. The first that the emergency services knew about Christopher's death was when they received a call from Hannah Gret using her neighbor's phone to say that her husband had died the night before. When they attended, they found Christopher clearly dead on the bathroom floor with a significant number of injuries. Hannah Gret had called the emergency services from her neighbor's phone. The Donnelly's landline was disconnected. Indeed, what soon emerges is that the Donnelly family, Hannah Gret, Christopher and their four children, had opted out of society. Not having a phone was a lifestyle choice. As she spoke to the ambulance operator, Hannah Gret told them that Christopher had died the night before, after becoming unwell. She claimed to have tried unsuccessfully to revive him. Paramedics en route to the scene did think it unusual that the patient had reportedly died hours earlier. The 999 operator um, questioned a little bit, saying, when did he die? And she told him it was 12 hours ago and that she hadn't called in the interim because they were coming to terms with his death. Police and ambulance turned up at the same time. There were wounds over his head and face, which looked several days old and had now scabbed over. It was then that the paramedics noted a significant quote. She admitted they had previously had a falling out, and when that happened, she had hit him with a rolling pin. As police made their inquiries, damning evidence began to emerge. She admitted that she had assaulted him at some point in the past, but he had just simply died. All in all, 
a series of highly abnormal events seem to have taken place. Leaving somebody that at some point you have presumably loved, regardless of what's happened in your relationship, to die on their own on a bathroom floor and not to call the authorities until some 12 hours after life is extinct indicates a, a, a lack of any moral fiber, a, a lack of any compassion. It, it is not a normal response to somebody's death and it's one of the most chilling things about this woman. Forensic psychologist Donna Youngs believes this was early evidence of an exceptionally possessive woman. The fact that Hanegret waited 12 hours before calling the police to tell them about his death tells me that even in his death, Christopher remains her possession. What happens to him, even after he's died, is her decision. Police bring the German-born Hanegret in to question her further. She had admitted assaulting Christopher in the past. Was that what had happened here? He tripped over and... and and fell, and she fell against the crate. There was a crate, and, and the, the crate got broken, and then he cut himself uh, in the head. Hers was a convoluted series of answers to simple questions. Veteran murder squad detective Peter Blexley believes that the police would quickly have suspected that this was far from an accident. The wounds to Christopher's head had not been caused by falling on a crate. When Christopher Donnelly's body was examined, 78 external injuries were found and internal injuries which included a fractured spine and a fractured neck. Even a cursory examination of the body would have clearly revealed evidence of domestic abuse. Forensic examinations were made in the sitting room of the house. Neil Lancaster's job in the Metropolitan Police was to keep an eye on criminals, to trace their every step when needed. There was a number of crucial findings within the home which actually did point towards this being a long-running systemic abuse. There was um, blood spatters found on the ceiling, there was blood found on the walls and blood found on furniture, which clearly indicated this isn't just uh, somebody who's got ill and died. This is someone who's been violently assaulted on a number of occasions. The blood spatters were analysed and discovered that they undoubtedly came from repeated injuries um, where Christopher had been hit with a blunt object. So the extent of those blood spatters was further evidence of systemic abuse over a long period of time. The key question which emerged was this. Christopher's death officially was from bronchopneumonia, but was that death hastened by violence meted out to him by his wife? And if so, was this a murder case? Donnelly gave what she thought was a completely rational reason for hitting Christopher. Her husband had fallen into a trance. Hitting him with a rolling pin was her way of getting him to snap out of it. I did hit him a bit harder sometimes and then uh, but as I said he never he, he it wasn't that he sort of fell fell uh, over and, and and lost consciousness Claire McIntosh is a former police detective now a crime writer Hannah Gret claimed that frequently the abuse was due to, to some desire to bring him out of what she called a, a trance, that he would be in a, a state where he wasn't listening and she would want to revive him from that. But what we know is that Christopher was a very, very ill man by this point. He was both physically and mentally weak and any trance that, that he was in was down to the very abuse that his wife was meeting out. Watching her performance closely, reveals much about Hannah Gret Donnelly. What I see here is somebody whose body language is very much at odds with the words coming out of her mouth. She's used to providing a believable, rational, reasonable, almost professional account of what happened. What was the real cause of Christopher Donnelly's death? Bronchopneumonia or years of beatings at the hands of his wife? Perhaps both. Was this a case of a lady who had killed.
The violence meted out to Christopher Donnelly was, according to his wife Hannah Gretz, just banter between husband and wife. It was more like, so we had a, a chase around the kitchen table or also, it was more, in, yeah, sometimes just, uh, yeah. Sorry, what did you say? A <laughs> chase around the kitchen hey. table it's in, in a more sort of light-hearted way. Her story was simply not adding up. As the interview progresses particularly, we see the body language starting to, to contrast sharply with that. So we start to see this, this slumped, defensive body language, these raised, I'm innocent kind of eyebrows, and the over gesticulation, which is a, a vain, a slightly desperate attempt to, to get her side of the story across, to maintain her side of the story. It would be a challenge, but to gather enough evidence to charge Hannah Gret Donnelly with murder meant detectives had to uncover what had been going on in an ordinary house on the Berryfields estate in Aylesbury. The couple had been married for 23 years. One time music teacher Christopher, a biochemistry graduate, played the clarinet and saxophone, having also studied at London's Guildhall College of Music and Drama. He and Hannah Gret had four children, aged between 13 and 21, at the time of Christopher's death. Husband and wife, four children, settled into a routine. It was one dictated by the strong matriarchal influence of Hannah Gret Donnelly. Hannah Gret Donnelly, in some respects, is a bit of a mystery. She and her family very much kept themselves to themselves. She trained as a midwife, but in fact hadn't worked since she'd had her children. She'd been a, a stay-at-home mum and, and homeschooling them. Her husband, Christopher, had a science background, but he was a very talented musician. He'd worked as a music teacher for a long time and, and performed as well. He was around the same age, a year older than his wife. Um, they'd been married for 23 years. So far, so normal, as the story of Hannah Gret Donnelly is told. But there were aspects of the Donnelly household which were dissimilar from the lives of their neighbours. They were incredibly a religious family with deeply held beliefs. They apparently had some type of view around uh, there being an end of day's existence. Um, they shunned modern technology. Indeed, what soon emerges is that the Donnelly family, Hannah Gret, Christopher and their four children, had opted out of society. At the heart of decision-making for the Donnellys, Hannah Gret. Hannah Gret had gradually begun to, to take more control of things in their relationship. She was not at all keen on the world outside of their own four walls. Such was their mistrust that they took their children out of mainstream education and schooled them at home. Increasingly, as uh, Hannah Gret and Christopher grew older, they retreated into the house, kept themselves to themselves. All the reports are that they lived a very insular existence and really didn't um, associate with neighbours or anything particularly such as that. Anna Gret has created a household that's almost like a, a separate land. It's a land under her dominion, uh, it's a land where she, Hannah Gret, has absolute power. And like any uh, territory under absolute dictatorial control, it's one where she keeps a very firm hold on the infiltration of, of any external influences. So there's, there's no technology allowed. The children are homeschooled. It's not just a physical, but it's actually a psychological fortress that she has created here. Was this part of a life pattern designed by Hannah Gret as part of a bigger agenda? Perhaps. Experts agree that isolation is a tried and trusted technique used by abusers to gain greater power over their vulnerable victims. It is possible, of course, for families to be very happy and self-sufficient to homeschool their own children, to avoid the evils of the internet and modern technology. But it also makes it much, much more difficult for any authorities to keep an eye on what's going on and to raise concerns if they see anything out of the ordinary. As for Christopher's life, it appeared to take an odd turn after he married. It started out well enough, but what police began to uncover was that he had become physically weak in recent years and mentally frail. Her husband, initially was a talented musician but quite clearly over time became more and more and more weak and became a shadow of his former self. By January 2018 he was effectively disabled 
unable to walk. Christopher's health simply dwindled over the years that he was married. Judging from the injuries he had suffered, and probably at the hands of his wife. We know that Christopher stopped working as a music teacher in 2015 due to ill health, and we can only assume that some of that ill health was as a result of Hannah Gret's treatment of him. His mental health began to suffer, and what's particularly distressing about this case is the knowledge that Hannah Gret was abusing her husband at the very time when he needed her support. So gradually, Christopher became weaker, not just physically, but mentally, until he wasn't able to defend himself at all. Detectives needed to know more from the woman outwardly cooperative, who might appear to some as an unlikely abuser. Could this lady be a killer? The pathologist said he had never seen a case where so many injuries were inflicted. That kind of says it all for Christopher, a 55-year-old man, to have been subjected to such abuse which led to so much scar tissue that even a home office pathologist was shocked. There were a number of old injuries as well that showed that Christopher's abuse had started many years previously. He had a cauliflower ear, um, which is more commonly associated with, with rugby player injuries, uh, and a fracture to the cartilage in his voice box, um, which was consistent with uh, attempted strangulation. These are not minor injuries. This is not a fit of peak. This is systematic physical abuse using third-party objects, not just using her fists. Terrible litany of awful, of awful injuries. And I think the finding of the pathologist was is that this systemic abuse had led to his bronchial infection, which killed him. Um, and it wouldn't have happened without this level of abuse which he'd been forced to undergo. The question that detectives had to answer was this. Can someone's death from pneumonia be directly related to beatings received over time? There are different types of pneumonia and some of them strike much more quickly than others. Some of them are very, very virulent. Some of them can strike completely healthy people and leave them almost at death's door within hours. But others are only likely to strike if somebody's physical condition has been so weakened that that germ can invade more deeply. It seems highly likely that Christopher was in such a physically weakened state that even his immune system was giving up. Women abusing men is not as unusual as some people might think. Alex Skeel was trapped in a long-term abusive relationship. His ordeal only ended after the jailing of his former partner and the mother of his two children. He's been considering what happened to Christopher Donnelly. You can't do anything right and I always think of it as if you offer to do the cooking, you're the worst cook in the world. Then if you don't offer to do the cooking, it's, oh, well, you never cook. So you never, ever write, you're always wrong. And there's so many examples that you're always walking on eggshells, as they say, and you're just so frightened of doing anything wrong. And then it gets to the point where you almost try and avoid any triggers that you know that will trigger her off. Tragically, abuse in a domestic setting is all too common. Usually, it is a man who is abusing a woman. But of course, there are situations where the tables are turned. You turn into just a robot and that's, you're just, that's just your way of life and you can't get out of it. In the vast majority of cases involving domestic abuse, men, are responsible for violence. What was emerging as detectives considered whether they could charge Hannah Gret Donnelly with murder was that Hannah Gret Donnelly's was far from a usual case. It's possible to divide Hannah Gret's behavior into two different types of abuse. So on the one hand, there was very strong evidence of systemic physical abuse, beatings with blunt objects, punching, jabbing in Christopher's throat. I suffered abuse for five years. Um, it started off with really small little things that happened, and it was 
simple things like, oh, you can't wear those shoes, I prefer these shoes, oh, you can't have your hair like that. I don't like the top you wear and I don't like the colour. So that type of control was down to Hannah Gret's desire for knowledge of everything that Christopher was doing, where he was going, what he was thinking, withholding trips to the toilet, withholding medical treatment, complete control of somebody else's life. What's unusual here is that that abuse does not seem to be motivated, as we might expect, by any kind of anger or, or hatred of her victim but rather by an unquestioning belief in her own absolute authority. This very much speaks to a woman who is a complete bully, who is an abuser and relatively unusually a physical abuser of a man, but also a woman who has no remorse and who believes that her enjoyment of life, her satisfaction, and that avoiding any irritations of her life are more important than anything else. It may even be that she got perverse pleasure out of tormenting her eventually completely powerless husband. It's now believed that Christopher suffered over a decade of abuse and throughout this time his physical condition was such that he was rendered effectively defenseless. So with every subsequent act of violence that she inflicted upon her husband, he was weakened. And therefore, the next act of violence became even more impactful, was even more uh, powerful, had an even more powerful effect. Um, she reduced him over time, almost to the state of, of a wounded animal. It was more like, so we had a, a chase around the kitchen table. Or, or so. It was more, in, yeah, sometimes just, um, yeah. Sorry, when you say chase around the kitchen table in, in a more sort of light-hearted way. The picture detectives were forming was of a living hell for a man hidden in plain sight from those who would pass the Donnelly home every day. Christopher beaten, scolded, trapped. Alex Skeel knows the feeling. Yeah, you just don't want to leave because you fear that possibly something could happen to the children. She even threatened to kill me if I tried to leave but you're just stuck. Goings on inside the Donnelly family were truly horrific, as police were finding out. Four children were part of the Donnelly family, yet none complained about their mother's treatment of their father. It's unlikely they could. It doesn't surprise me that none of the children came forward to the authorities. It's clear that Hannah Gret ruled that family with a rod of iron, and no doubt anyone in that family, children as well as Christopher, were absolutely terrified of her. And because the family had no visitors, saw few people, Christopher had no means of hope. His children kept isolated from those who might help. What shocked me the most was just how vulnerable Christopher was. And the fact that nobody noticed that here was a family with children who were living on a very ordinary estate in a very ordinary town, and yet somehow they went under the radar. Hannah Gret Donnelly's power and rule over Christopher was unquestionable. The abuse was so often that it became the norm. The dynamics of the relationship had now shifted so heavily to one side that Christopher was at this point unable to function without his wife say so. What is clear here is that the level of control and the level of abuse made this an almost everyday occurrence, a level of abuse that had simply become accepted. It's just so lonely and dark and you don't have anyone to talk to. I can imagine there was probably no conversations that went on between them other than arguments. It's the way it is, and it's just a really horrible way to live. I have read some reports where Hannah Gret suggested that Christopher almost invited these beatings. Well, I struggle to think of anybody who would like a whack over the head with a rolling pin. I also struggle to think that a relationship that plumbed the depths that this did was ever a relationship that was ever built on equality. 
but what was in it for Hannah Gret? Why did she do it? So my sense is with Hannah Gret that it comes from a way of thinking rather than from any profound emotional trauma. Um, to me, it feels like somebody who was almost brainwashed as a child, somebody who's come out of some really kind of bizarre childhood upbringing that has taught her to think in this way about human relationships and about the need to maintain control. That's, that's what I would suspect um, with Hannah Gret. What we do know was her power over Christopher was complete. After the police arrested Hannah Gret, they seized her diary, and among the entries in there was clear evidence of abuse, not least the fact that Hannah Gret had refused to let her husband go to the toilet. And this withholding of a basic human need is particularly cruel. It's not just controlling, but it's, um, it's dehumanizing, and it, it's a, a particularly shocking part of this case. It now seems likely that Christopher Donnelly actually thought he was the one who was in the wrong, as he suffered from years of abuse. Blaming it upon yourself when you are a victim is quite common. Most people that I've spoken to, that's male, female, whatever gender, age, ethnicity, I've had thousands of people message me. They've all said the same thing. I thought it was my fault, when in fact it isn't at all. They're just made to believe that. And that's why it kind of makes it worse, because I think for a lot of people, you try and sort of please them more so they make out that it isn't your fault, because you just completely feel that it's your fault and you're doing something wrong, so you try and change it, but then it goes back to what I was saying about cooking the food and not cooking the food. It just goes back to that. It's a vicious circle, and it just goes round and round and round. And I think, yeah, I you do feel as though it's your own fault, but then part of you knows that it isn't. The problem facing detectives, having amassed the evidence of abuse and control of Christopher, was proving that he'd been murdered. If Hannah Greta was a killer, how could they get her to confess? An interview in a murder case such as this will be, there'll be a, a formal strategy which will be agreed with the senior investigating officer. First of all, they try to sort of Sort, sort things out with him in, in sort of a mm -hmm. bantering sort of way. The strategy would have been, we need to find out what's going on, we need to get her talking. That didn't seem to be a problem. She seemed eager to talk. And they would then be thinking, I mean, obviously to prove murder, they need to prove that she caused really serious harm to him and she intended to cause really serious harm to him. That would then prove murder, bearing in mind he's dead, if they can prove that she inflicted the injury upon him that resulted in his death. During the police interviews, what becomes quickly apparent is to a person like Hannah Gret, violence and assault is something that is a perfectly acceptable tool to reinforce her dominance. Yeah, I, I did hit him a bit harder sometimes. Hannah Gret Donnelly's police interviews are truly chilling. I don't think I've ever heard a criminal talk in such a dispassionate way about such a horrific crime. As I said, he never, he, he, it wasn't that he sort of fell, fell uh, over and, and, and lost consciousness. She dismisses her actions as, as banter and uh, as normal behavior in a relationship and really shows no sign of compassion or love for the man that she's killed. It was more like, so we had a chase around the kitchen table or so. It was more, in, yeah, sometimes just, um, yeah. Sorry, what did you say? A chase around the kitchen okay. table in, in a more sort of light-hearted way. And it was quite disturbing to watch. She was incredibly calm, not visibly distressed, and almost matter-of-fact in... She actually described what had happened at the house in almost a forensic level of detail. Um, she would almost talk about that there would be banter between them whilst she was assaulting him. It was an incredibly cavalier view of what was a, a, a terrible systemic level of violence towards her husband. She came across as incredibly cold and detached from what must have been an entirely horrific situation. I'd like to know what's going on, so... But... It sounds very much as if this woman was paranoid. To be informed as to what is going on, I don't like uh, 
Like different people talk behind my back. She was absolutely determined to be in control at all times, and she didn't like any secrets going on. Now, that paranoia might have meant that she felt that people were scheming behind her back. Heaven knows they had reason to try and scheme and get away. So it was all part of this idea of keeping control. This was clearly a woman who was terrified of losing control. I get upset when I feel that there's some sort of things going on that, that uh, I'm not told about. That's why she had to keep her family near her. She kept them under her thumb inside the home. Now that would mean that they wouldn't feel they had anywhere they could go and speak freely, anywhere that they could be themselves. And of course, anybody that they could turn to for help. I've met lots of criminals over the course of my police career and I've researched even more uh, as a result of my crime writing years. Uh, I don't think I've ever come across such a terrifying figure as Hannah Gret Donnelly. The lack of compassion and the extent of her, of her abuse is, is truly horrific and arguably if I wrote a character that bad I'm not sure anyone would believe that she could exist. The challenge facing detectives was to get Hannah Gret Donnelly to confess. What was her body language saying to them as they asked her to explain her husband's death? Does that mean he's fallen down the whole, pretty much the whole flight of stairs? No, no. As I said, he... he... It's an interesting gradual evolution of, of recognition that she just might have done something wrong. She fell against the crate, there was a crate, and the, the crate got broken and then he cut himself. What does Hannah Gret Donnelly's body language say during her interviews with police in connection with the death of her husband, Christopher? Expert forensic psychologist Donnie Youngs watched the interview as Donnelly simply tries to explain away how she treated him before hitting him with a rolling pin. First of all, I tried to sort of sort of sort things out with him in, in sort of a bantering sort of way. Donnelly freely admitted hitting Christopher. I punched him on his nose severely because I was so angry with him, but he didn't have such a big cut. He, he had just a small cut. Do you feel that hitting him over the head with a rolling pin, with a hairbrush, using your hands and fists, is a appropriate reaction to him acting in that way, being in his strange well, moods? It's, it's more like this helping him to come out of some sort of peculiar trance. Just how uncomfortable she's starting to feel. We can see in the way that she clenches her hands together as if trying to give herself some kind of reassurance. But if you're on the landing... And there's the, 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 the mystified shaking of the head. Does that mean he's fallen down the whole, pretty much the whole flight of stairs? No, no. As I said, he... He it's an interesting uh, gradual and, uh, him on the back and he a bit evolution of, and then he, he of recognition that she just might have done something wrong over the progress of the interview for me that is revealed in, in the body language becoming a bit more marked. I mean, here we have her sitting just with her hands on, the, on her lap, almost like a, a, a school child being reprimanded in a, in a headmaster's office. These times that you've hit him, um, they weren't a result of him being violent to you? No. During the interviews, the detectives tried to establish whether Hannah Gret felt she was justified in doing what she did. She did not. Within your family, what would you say your role is? Um. Yeah, I don't know. She pauses in annoyance. She's annoyed at being asked this question. She thinks it's none of the interviewer's business. She has never had to explain herself within within her household. I like to know what's going on. So, but yeah, uh, I like to be informed as to what is going on. I don't like uh, like when people talk behind my back. Here we hear these remarkable statements about 
um, how she likes to be kept informed um, and and how it, people talking behind her back. Uh, I mean, the, the, the controlling tone of these statements, um, given that she's talking about her family, is remarkable. I'm a bit upset when I feel that there's some sort of things going on that, that uh, I'm not told about. There's no indication in her, in her face, her expression, her body language, that she's aware that what she's saying is in any way potentially offensive. It's, it's more like this... <sighs> helping him to come out of some sort of peculiar trans... A trans like, no, it, I can't say it's a trans, but it's sort of peculiar, yeah, feeling feeling strangely, I don't know. This is very interesting where for a moment, she gives up for just a moment. She's exhausted by the questions. This is the first flicker of recognition to herself that she's guilty, but also that she may be, be being seen as guilty by the interviewer, that she may have lost her hold on control. The use of the word trance by Donnelly may have some element of truth behind it, again, because of Christopher's condition. Bronchial pneumonia can cause a wide variety of symptoms, but of course it can have an impact on your mental state, because if you're lacking oxygen to the brain and if you have germs flooding around your body, you can feel lightheaded, you can feel dizzy, you can feel confused, and it's entirely possible that your level of consciousness would drop so that you would enter what his wife described as a, quote, trance-like state. No normal wife would dream of dealing with that by hitting him with the rolling pin to knock it out of him. But that is what she did, whether or not she was prepared to admit it. Yeah, there's a lot of pride in the, the general body language here. There's a, a refusal to alter her expression, whatever the interviewer throws at her. The, the expression is just maintained throughout. There's, there's no natural response, and that, that's an indication of a, a, lot of, a lot of pride in the personality. Hannah Grepp had clearly lost touch with any shred of common decency. She would beat Christopher if he didn't answer a question quickly enough, or if she felt he was in some kind of trance. She was evil, she terrified him, and she ran that house through fear and intimidation. One can only imagine what horrors the children may have seen or heard. I feel sorry for him, but again, I just feel, I know how he was feeling at that time. Like I knew that my body was shutting down and I was waiting to die. I just thought, well, the next time I get stabbed, the next time I get hit, it's gonna be in the wrong place or the knife's gonna go a little bit deeper or go in the wrong way. And eventually I just, my body will shut down and I can completely, I don't know, I'm uncomfortable thinking about it. Dehumanising a victim, which is what Donnelly did to Christopher, helped her justify the beatings. So Hennigret is what we call a victim as object murderer, um, meaning that she doesn't see her victim as fully human, so that actually they're not that relevant to her as an individual in any kind of emotional sense. And the murders, the murders in these types of cases can often be the incidental, the, the, the consequences simply of her um, uh, enactment of her absolute control on an object. The murder is, is often incidental. Hanagret's initial wounding charge was soon escalated to murder after all of the forensic post-mortem and interview evidence was collated. The amount of evidence stacked against Hanagret Donnelly was huge going into trial, but still, she put in a not guilty plea. She also maintained the fact that she never intended to kill her husband. And it was possible that a jury might accept her plea, but they did not. 
Despite her not guilty plea, she was found unanimously guilty by the jury on the 20th of March 2019 and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 16 years. Anna Greta Donnelly is statistically a very rare killer. She coerced her husband. It is so much more often the other way around in cases of domestic abuse and murder. But as Alex Skeel discovered, violence can come from anybody. Christopher Donnelly discovered that too. At the start of our relationship, it was the first relationship that I had. So everything felt normal. But obviously now I can look back and see things and go, well, that wasn't. But at the time, I was happy. It was nice to sort of tell your mates that you went out at the weekend and just felt normal. But obviously things steadily gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then I just find it weird that I was a sort of young person in sixth form and then five years later, for no fault of my own, I was about two weeks away, 10 days from dying, and I could feel that happening. But it wasn't my fault that that was happening, it was just a terrible place to be in, and there's nothing I could have done about it, because I literally had no money. Hannah Gretz Donnelly had beaten her husband, taken complete control over his life and that of her children. She had denied him his self-respect, coercing him into becoming completely submissive, and she had regularly beaten him. It was the degradation and abuse that he suffered which led directly to his physical condition, so that when he contracted pneumonia, his life was on the line, not because of the illness, but because of his wife. It might be easy to assume that the, the most shocking element of this case is that the offender is a woman. We're perhaps very used to domestic violence being committed by men, but m men are victims of domestic violence far too often. And, and what this case shows is that this is a very real problem that, that needs to be addressed regardless of the, the genders of the people involved. Hannah Gret Donnelly will not be eligible for parole until 2034. Safeguards and support have been put in place for the couple's four children. Meanwhile, the neat rows of pleasant houses on the edge of an historic town continue to provide homes for ordinary families, where beatings are rare and where now the community is free from a lady who killed. <laughs>